Hello everyone, I'm Sebastian Y, and this is Foundations of Economics. In this video, we're going to talk about the public policy options around externalities. Our main focus is going to be on pollution and emissions, which are one of the biggest problems facing the modern economy. There are two broad approaches to dealing with this externality, command and control policies and market-based policies. Command and control policies are direct regulations of behavior, while market-based policies use incentives to nudge behavior in the direction that the government wants. Command and control policies are the most straightforward. It simply requires or forbids certain behaviors. These types of policies are often referred to as regulation. It would be impossible for the government to completely forbid pollution because this would mean all modern transportation methods would be eliminated. Instead, what they can do is require certain reductions in pollution. This is very difficult to do efficiently because the government does not have reliable information on how costly it is for each individual polluter to reduce pollution. In the U.S., regulation is handled by the Environmental Protection Agency. They're responsible for determining and enforcing regulation. They might also require certain technologies to be adopted, such as more fuel-efficient engines and cleaner production methods. Let's consider an example of a command and control policy. Suppose there are two firms who emit pollution, firm A and firm B. Each firm emits 10 tons of pollution. It costs firm A $75,000 to reduce each ton, while it costs firm B only $30,000 per ton to reduce pollution. Suppose the government wanted to cut the pollution in half, from a total of 20 down to just 10. In terms of social efficiency, it would make sense for firm B to be the one who gets rid of all the pollution because it's a lot cheaper to do so. But the government might not know that firm B is the one who can do it more cheaply, and firm B does not have an incentive to let that information come out because they don't want to end up spending all that money. So what the government might end up doing is requiring both firms to cut their pollution by half. They could do this by setting a legal limit on pollution to a total of 5 tons. Both firm A and B will be forced to reduce the pollution, which will incur a total cost to society of 75,000 times 5 plus 30,000 times 5. That comes out to a total of $525,000 cost to society to reduce that 10 tons of pollution. We'll keep this number in mind as we move forward. The next type of policy we are going to examine is a corrective tax. This is the first of two market-based solutions to externalities. A corrective tax is often called a Pigovian tax, which is named after the British economist Arthur Pigot, who came up with this idea. In environmental policy, the government can place a fine on pollution. They don't make it illegal, but they make it costly, essentially setting a price for pollution. Firms that are able to reduce pollution at a cost below the tax have an incentive to do so, while firms whose cost to reduce pollution is above the fine will simply prefer to pay the fine. This is going to sort the polluters into the ones with a higher cost to reduce and the ones with the lower cost to reduce, and the pollution with the lowest cost to reduce will be the ones that end up getting reduced. We can use the concept of a demand curve to illustrate this. Different polluters will have different costs to reduce pollution, and so we will get a demand curve for pollution rights. By setting a fine for pollution at a certain level, we can end up reducing pollution to a desired amount. This will be the amount of pollution left, and this quantity will be pollution eliminated. Since these polluters over here on the right can reduce pollution relatively easily, they're going to be the ones who do so. Looking at our example, suppose that the government set a tax of 50,000 per unit of pollution emitted. It costs firm A 75,000 per unit, so they're not going to bother reducing, they'll simply prefer to pay the tax. But it costs firm B 30,000 per unit, 
which is lower than the fine, so they would prefer to get rid of their pollution entirely. The cost to doing so would be 30,000 times 10 for a total cost to society of 300,000, which is a lot lower than the 525,000 that we had before. This results in the exact same reduction in total pollution at a much lower cost to society. The final policy we are going to examine is known as cap and trade, also known as tradable pollution permits. This type of policy starts out very similarly to command and control, where the government issues a certain number of pollution permits to each firm. The difference is that they allow the firms to buy and sell the permits to each other. Each firm's willingness to pay for a permit depends on their cost to reduce pollution. What will end up happening is the firms who can reduce pollution for a relatively low cost will end up selling their permits to the firms who have a relatively high cost to reduce pollution. Those low cost firms will then make a profit off of that while still eliminating the pollution. This system has a lot of advantages because the government does not actually need very much information to successfully implement it. They don't need to know which are the high cost and which are the low cost firms. The government can simply select a target pollution level, issue the permits, and let the market go to work. The firms will then figure all of this out on their own. The initial distribution of the permits also does not matter. The permits will always flow from the low to the high cost firms. In the end, we will get the same result as the corrective tax. Let's illustrate this with a quick graph. If we again have our demand for pollution rights, we are now effectively setting the quantity of pollution instead of setting the price. Once that amount has been set, the firms will buy and sell the permits to each other. This is going to create a market price for permits as they are bought and sold between firms. We will again have a quantity of pollution left and a quantity of pollution eliminated. Going back to our example, suppose that the government issues five permits per firm. Remember that it costs firm A $75,000 to reduce each unit of pollution and firm B only $30,000. The gap between these two costs gives us room to make a deal. Firm B could sell their five permits to firm A for a price of anywhere between thirty and seventy-five thousand and both parties will benefit. For example, they might come to an agreement which involves selling the permits for a price of fifty thousand each. So A is going to buy five permits, B is going to sell five permits. Firm A now holds a total of ten permits, meaning they don't need to reduce pollution at all. Firm B now has zero permits, meaning that they need to get rid of all their pollution, which is going to incur a cost of 30,000 times 10, which is, again, 300,000, just like we had with the corrective tax. This is an efficient result, which is better than the command and control outcome. In general, economists tend to prefer market-based solutions for pollution because they can achieve a good outcome at a lower cost to society. These are going to be useful tools for governments to deploy over the next few decades dealing with all of the pollution problems that are facing the world. This has been a brief introduction to externalities. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Thanks for watching.